you've never bought into black inferiority. They may condescend to you. They may try to close a door to you, but it's up to you to accept or reject that. I've discovered that the people who do well in life are the people who learn to manage their challenges well because the challenges are inevitable. Pitfalls of victimization, they're inevitable. There's an infection in the human heart that makes people discriminate and treat each other the way that we do. And it has little to do with skin color. Tracy Arlington, your company is... Play Safe Defense. You know how to play it safe and take care of yourself because you're a black belt in Taekwondo, correct? Correct. Tell me about Play It Safe. What is it you guys set out to do? What's your objective? What's your mission statement? Our mission statement is to teach children how to self-protect, teaching them the ABCs of self-defense, awareness, boundaries, and the chihuahua confidence to set the boundary, mm -hmm. um, but in an age-appropriate way. So... Uh, we teach kids as, as young as four, and of course, we're going to teach them a lot different than we would a teenager, but the kids get that whole concept. If a chihuahua can bark off a big dog, they can too. So right. their biggest weapon is their voice, and that's what we really want to um, you know, teach them to use okay. and set the boundaries. I want to talk about bullying. You, again, have some great, actually hands-on, specific advice for kids to use if they're being bullied at school. So right. take us yeah. through that. Okay. Let's assume that we've got a kid that's being tormented, verbally abused at school. We had a young man that was nine years old. He was gay at a school in Denver, Colorado. He was in school for four days and killed himself reportedly because of bullying. Right. And we see this just so often time and time again. Right. I just know if you had worked with this young man before he started school and he had some techniques and skills and abilities, he would be alive today. Right. What do you tell kids that are being bullied? Well, it's two, it's two sided. So, um, with the little ones, we find that it's not as, it's not as much bullying as it is more friendship drama. But then when we, we get into middle school and high school, um, that's probably where we see more of the, the bullying that killed this young man. So um, the Girl Scouts call me the girl whisperer because girl drama is my specialty. And friendship conflict is probably what we see the most. So I would say the majority of parents that bring their kids into our class, it's it's to handle all of that. You're not my friend anymore. Um, you can't play with us because you're not good. Um, I'm better at that than you are. So what we do is we teach them verbal karate. So you punch me with a mean comment. So um, yeah, go ahead and tell me I'm ugly, and I'm going to show you the wrong way. All right. You're just an ugly loser. Yeah, whatever. Like, I really care what you think just because you're Dr. Phil. <laughs> See? Well, that so, really hurts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the wrong way to handle it, right? Because didn't I just lose my power to you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Sassiness attracts more sassiness. Yeah. I have this huge poster of a sassy Sasquatch that we tell the kids you don't want to say, so I don't care who cares or whatever. So now we're going to replace those with more powerful responses. So. Yeah, because when you do what you're talking about, then they've poked and you've reacted. And you've responded. They they've got the desired reaction. And they have your power. Yeah, they've gotten right. under your skin, so uh -huh. they've got control. Right. Okay, so. Now, so tell me I'm ugly again. All right, you're just an ugly loser. Oh, that's good to know. Hey, um, how was your summer? Uh, well, you, uh, uh, fine. <laughs> I mean, it, it takes the air out of it. It takes right. the air out of the balloon, right? right? Yeah. So responses like, um, we have an acronym called winner. W, walk away. I, ignore the comment and don't look back. N, no sassiness. Say, okay, sure. Or good to know. Or indeed <laughs> noted. The next N, say something nice, change the subject. E is exit, so don't engage, don't fight. And then the R is report, and that's our acronym. And so we actually role play the kids in the class they have. They go back and forth, so they'll say, you're a baby. And then the other their partner has to say, hey, good to know. And they practice back and forth, back and forth. And then what we also do, though, and which I'm very proud of is uh, about, is that we teach them to resolve conflict with the yo-yo friend. Because that's the number one complaint I hear from the kids. 
one day she's nice to me, the next day she's not. Then she's nice, then she's not. And so we actually talk about the difference between a yo-yo friend and a true friend and how to resolve that conflict with that friend, because that's what I hear the most in elementary school. Then you turn the road and you get to middle school and high school, and that's where we see, you know, uh, more of the, you know, bullying at, at its extreme. Chief David Brown, July 6th of 2016, you were a Dallas police chief. July 7th, 2016, you became America's police chief. Now, you became chief in 2010, yes. right? Yes, in 2010. And you had just been in that job for weeks when you lost your son. Yes. My son was uh, 27 years old, uh, living on his own, and he had been experiencing, I'm finding this out after the fact, experiencing bipolar, schizophrenic, adult onset behavior, right. hearing voices. Uh, he and his girlfriend had uh, tried to get help. He didn't like the medication. He told her not to talk to me, not to tell me about it. He was embarrassed about his mental health. Um, I was unawares. Um, he has a psychotic episode. He ex he's experimenting with uh, marijuana that's laced uh, with uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And he gets a gun and just starts shooting. He's shot and killed by police, uh, and an officer is killed in this horrific shootout in a suburb of Dallas. And I'm in a job just a few weeks. Burying a child is bad enough, but the circumstances that that happened was just over the top grief. So he shot and killed one of your officers? A, a suburban cop. Right. Yeah. And then he was killed yes. by an officer. Yes. And he was mentally ill. Yes. I mean, it's a perfect storm. Police, it's like, it's like a family. So you grieving twofold. Yeah. You, you, you're grieving for the loss of your child and you're grieving for the loss of a police brother. And, and there, there's people talk about, you know, what, what do you say? Nothing you can say to, it's, it's a grief and a pain that's dark and deep. It, it really is. And it's, uh, but for my faith in Christ that I'm able to even talk about it. And I think it's important for me to talk about it. It's, it, it's therapy for me. I've talked about it on more than one occasion, uh, but the despair and, and, and the, 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 just the, lo the sense of loss, it, it, it's, it's, and I know you've talked to a lot of people that's lost people that they love. It's a big hole that never gets filled. It, there, there's time doesn't help people. Tell you, you know, just give it some time. Time doesn't help. Uh, it, it's it, it's just the burdens we bear uh, that, in this life, and you just have to take a step and then take another. And I, I got back to work as chief after two weeks off, Doctor Field, and the the criticisms were brutal. Were brutal. Um, the cops feel a sense of, you know, your son's a cop killer. That's the worst of the worst thing you could be. Uh, and, you know, politicians do their thing, you know, trying to figure out which way the wind is blowing. Uh, I will say uh, the, the person that hires, the city manager form of government in Dallas. And so the city manager hires the police chief. Uh, not the mayor or city council members. And city manager Mary Soon never wavered in her support for me during that time. She, mm -hmm. she, she really was uh, more than stand up. You know, I can't find the words to say, even to this day, how much I appreciate how Mary uh, stood by me and helped me continue to lead the department. I'm here with Joseph Raymond Lucero. He is an actor. He is a lot of different things, but he grew up on the mean streets. And when I say mean streets, I'm talking about he is a third generation gang member whose parents, brothers, uncles were all in the life, struggled with heroin addiction, 
and Joseph was in trouble with the law at the ripe age of nine years old, was in youth detention, spent 12 of his first 26 years in the California State Penitentiary. And his son was born while he was in state prison, and that was a life-changing event for him. When was the first time you were actually involved directly with a gang? I want to say about 10 or 11. We started off uh, skateboarding. We called ourselves Team Tiny. Myself, uh, Michael Nillis, Travis Seaman, um, Tyson Haynard. And that was turned out to be my homeboy Trippy, my homeboy Smokey, my homeboy Silent. We went from being skaters to pretty much getting jumped all the time by all the gangs around. We finally said, F it. You know what I mean? We started our own gang. And when that happened, there was only like five or six of us. And now there's I mean, there's hundreds of them. You know what I mean? And it's still a going concern. It's still a going concern, yeah. i I walked away from that years ago. Yeah. You know. When you say you were getting jumped a lot by gangs, what does that mean? You would be in, in their neighborhood? How did you intersect with these guys? To and from school. You know, you come across anybody that, you know, where you from, homie? You know what I mean? And basically, if you're not from your neighborhood, you're going to, you're susceptible to an ass whooping, if not a shooting or a stabbing. Mm-hmm. At that time, we were still fighting, even though the guns were, they, they, they were they were there. You know what I mean? Um, to and from school, you would have shootouts. So, I mean, sometimes we did school, and we couldn't tell you why we did school. I mean, you didn't want to come to school. It was hard to get to school sometimes. How old were you when you first carried a weapon? I was 13 years old. And uh, I remember my father, my stepfather, and I don't use that term a lot because he's not my biological father, but he was the father that that accepted me and was there for me, you know, Um and he was fully in that, engulfed in that, but he did change his life at the end of his life because he ended up dying of pancreatic cancer. And when I say he taught me certain things on how to induct myself as a young gang member, he knew the right way, if, if that's even proper to say, because there's no promotion from my end for the gangs, but he wanted me to live it the right way, you know, very contradictive, you know, don't hurt women or children. But if that's the opposition across the table, then you do what you need to do to make sure that we stand we stand tall always. Um, I bring a gun home, and my dad slapped the shit out of me. And I remember crying and him saying to me, what's going to happen when six dudes run up on you and jump you? I'm going to fight. I'm going to scrap. Take an ass whoop and shut up. And he slapped me again. You're lying to me. You're going to pull that gun out, and you're going to shoot. And then you're going to do something that you're never going to forgive yourself for and you're never going to be able to take back. You're going to take somebody's life and you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. And that was the first time in my life that I had really understood maybe how important or what guns could really do because here's somebody that I looked up to and wanted to be like and he's shooting that that down, that avenue down for me. And all my homeboys had guns. And he taught me the fighting. You know, you... There's, you know, he just taught me certain things to be a proper gang member. And I hate to use that because there's nothing proper or right about being a gang member. But there is a culture and there are mores and folkways within the gang. They have a protocol. They have a code of conduct within the gangs, right? Yes, sir. And that's what he was teaching you. Yes, sir. So you didn't run afoul of that and disrespect somebody without realizing what disrespect look like or what behaviors would be interpreted that way. Yeah. And then the consequences to follow that, you know what I mean? I wasn't aware of those things. This was the first time I got the tattoo. I got San Diego on the back of my neck. He wanted to slap the shit out of me again. San Diego was big. You don't own San Diego. What the hell did you do to, to put that city on the back of your neck? And I remember thinking, I thought I was cool. I got San Diego. I'm tattooed like my dad. I'm getting closer to being like the man that, that I want to be. That's just, that I doesn't see me as his son or whatever the case may be, I thought I was becoming more like him because I was becoming more of a cholo and I was I was putting in work. I was getting the tattoos. I was trying to be like him. I thought that's what I had to do to, to earn that love. And I got another school in on tattoos. You earn those. You don't just put them on. 
lames put them on. You're not a lame, son. And what's a lame? In his way, a lame would be somebody that is doing the gang stuff for all the wrong reasons and has all the bad schooling techniques on how to be a gang member. If you're going to be a gang member, do it right. It's very contradictive. We don't hurt women or children. We do what we do, and the opposition knows that they're the opposition and we're their opposition. So there's an understanding between the two of us. The perpetrators for 80 or 90 percent of the violence are among bad actors you can count on both hands. It might be six, eight, ten people in a micro-focused area within a neighborhood. That means if the right people, the police officers, the social workers, the parole officers, the probation officers, can get this mentality and sit down with those young men, and they are men, and they are young, and they are identifiable, we know who they are, we know who's doing what they're doing, and get this across to them that they do have a choice and that it's them that needs to take off the glasses that see the world in this way, significant changes can be made with a relatively small number of people in every community. That's correct. Because we know who they are, we know where they are, and you're talking about a mindset they need to embrace. And if they will, then the whole tenor of the neighborhood can change. i seen it when we take them out and we incarcerate them, but they tend to come back or somebody tends to come up in their place. But if instead of doing that, you change their leadership, you change their influence, then you can change the tenor of the whole neighborhood. And and doctor, I'll add one more component to that, which I'm the greatest advocate for family. I I take tremendous pride and esteem in being a father. So in that same scenario that you're communicating, and maybe this is a completely different show, we have to talk about the role of the family and the role of fathers in the home and fathers having a zero victim mindset to to teach their children. It's really amazing that the, the Bible, even though women carry the baby and nurture the baby, the Bible, the Bible tells fathers to raise your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and don't exasperate them, don't provoke them to wrath. It was God intended for the fathers to be the educator and to define in the home. And so another missing conversation with victim thinking and the challenges that we're seeing in our our society is we're not really addressing the role and the importance of of fathers and building strong families. Now, the second second part of that, when we talk about you know, just the 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 attitude, the overall attitude of victim victim thinking. Um, we travel, we get to travel the nation, and you know, even internationally, quite a bit. I get to meet people from all over America, and I'm amazed at the common denominators of of decency, living a good life, a quality life that most people in America want the exact same thing. And when you talk about those micro pockets, those uh, you know, those those small areas where you're seeing trouble come from those areas. I think the same thing is happening in our nation with the division that it's not widespread across the nation. The nation is not as divided as we're being, you know, taught and told that it really is. Most people I think have unified, unified around the common denominators, good old fashioned life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I, I, my, my one criticism of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, I said he got the order wrong instead of life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. It should be liberty, the pursuit of happiness and life. I think everything starts with being free. And once you are free, you are now free. You have the liberty for the pursuit of happiness. And as you pursue happiness in life, it creates a life for you. That's the power of zero victim thinking, that any person who is subject to victim thinking, you don't have a life. You're not free. You're not able to pursue your goals, your calling you lose the dignity of, of being who God created you to be, to give your best, to be your best, not only for yourself and your family, but for your community. Don't deprive the world of the greatness and the great potential that is inside you because you're living subject to victim thinking. I really want to see uh, a mass liberation take place and see this broken over our nation. I think it'll, it'll lead us to a place that we'll all benefit in, in ways that we've never, we've never imagined before. 